the fall season to get here. Amen. God is so good to us. We are going to continue our study on strength and trials. Not that any of you ever go through any trials in this life. But it's just good to have this information just in case you do. So we are going to continue. And I've enjoyed this study. I tell you, as I've been going through it, I learn more. And Brother Samuels can testify to this. I have learned more when I study and prepare for a lesson than ever uh, just sitting and enjoying a lesson. Studying and digging it out, there's always so much that I look at, I go, man, I never saw that. But just looking at the Lord opens my eyes to it. So I believe that the things that happen to us in this life come through God. He's the gatekeeper, Amen. right? And so that's what we're going to be looking at here. So my key scripture is found in Deuteronomy chapter number 8 and verse 16. And it talks about the purpose. It's comforting to know that there is a purpose. These things don't just happen. Says, Who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers do not? And then he tells you why. That he might humble thee, and that he might prove thee to do thee good at the latter end. At the end of the journey, it's for your good, right? And thou say in thine heart, my power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. So we're going to go through this study, and I'm going to show you as we're going through the study talking about these trials, I believe there's different kinds of trials, and I'm going to kind of break it down as we go through it. This last week we talked about the uh, trials in the wilderness, and I'm going to recap a couple of things that we talked about, and then I'm going to move into another kind of a trial that you go through. So the first one is the wilderness trials. That's what we talked about, the purpose. And he told you there in the wilderness test or the trials, the reasons. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, we just pray this morning over your word and our hearts. Let them come together, Lord, this morning. Draw us close to you. We pray, God, that your presence, your spirit, the comforter, lead us, guide us into the truth. Open our understandings. Help us to glean and to receive, Lord. Help us to grow, to become more like Jesus. Lord, we want to change, to improve, to understand. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. Amen. The purpose of the wilderness test. So if you find yourself, you feel like you're in a wilderness and you're going through a testing time. These are some of the reasons, the purpose, to humble you, to prove your character, to teach you that you need more than bread. Man does not live by bread alone. God is teaching you that. To discipline us for maturity or self-control. And to reveal to us that it is not our own strength that made us prosper. These are some of the things that God is teaching us as we're going through these trials in the wilderness. The word, the word wilderness is defined as a desert place, a place uncultivated or lived in, or a state of disorder. Wilderness places are places of difficulties, pressures, insufficient resources, oppositions, and of course, everyone, when they're going through the wilderness, what do they say? Why is this happening to me? So if you feel yourself in a difficult spot and it just seems like it's happening and it's one thing stacked upon another and you're feeling this pressure and it seems like there's always opposition and there's never enough resources, 
and you're always wondering why, could it be that the Lord is trying to show you that one of these things? To humble you, to prove your character, to teach you that you need Him? Could it be to reveal some of these things to you? You know, one of the worst things that can happen is for you to get to a place where you begin to think that, oh, I don't need to pray so much. I've got this figured out. I'm kind of comfortable where I'm at. I never want to get to a place to where I feel comfortable where I'm at. You know, we are not safe until the good old gospel ship pulls up to the port and they lash the ropes and we say, we made it. The gangplank has been lowered and we walk down and the angels are cheering and we're stepping onto streets of gold. That's when we can say, we made it. But until we get there, we have got to be on guard. We have to be vigilant, right? So we can't say, oh, I've got it all figured out. No, storms could come at any moment. There could be a sudden wind that just comes in and begins to rock our boat. So we have to be ready. And so God allows these storms to come in our life. But you know what? He keeps us through the storm. He doesn't always keep us out of the storm, but He keeps us through the storm. Right? So we're going to face these things. Remember, and this is a recap, and we're going to move into the new area here in a minute. Remember, God is more interested in character. What are we more interested in? Comfort. We're more interested in comfort. Man cannot see his weakness until circumstances reveal it. And patience is revealed when something hinders our progress. Pride is revealed when we're forced to do something menial. Has that ever happened to you? And you realize, hmm... I don't think I should have to do that. That's beneath me. Hmm. Stubbornness is revealed when we're forced to do something we do not desire to do, but we fight ourselves and make ourselves do it anyway. The purpose of every test. Remember, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. So the purpose of every test is to reveal what we understand, to reveal what we don't understand, and to reveal the applicability of the lesson. The bottom line is, as we're going through these tests, God is wanting to reveal to us what our heart is made of. And if we don't see it, guess what happens? Sometimes we have to go through the test again. And again. Why does this keep happening to me? Sometimes God allows things to continue to happen in our life because He loves us. And He's not going to let us make it up the next rung in the ladder until we pass this test. But you're not going to have to pace to face the test alone. He's there with you as you're struggling through the test. And you're going to be ready to make it to the next rung. Anybody ready to go to the next rung in the ladder? I feel like I've been stuck on this rung for a while. And I'm ready to climb to the next rung in the ladder. There's some people who are totally satisfied to be on this rung down here. Personally, I'm not. I want more. Oh, that I might know him. That I might know him. I want to get to know him even more. Amen. I'm glad that one day we will see face to face. For now, we see through a glass darkly. But then we will know even as we are known. Right now, we're seeing through a glass darkly. But you know, God can reveal things to us through the Spirit. If we will get into the spiritual realm, God will reveal more and more of Himself to us. 
Or we can choose to sit on the bottom rung and keep doing the same test over and over again and never advance to the next level. Why? Because he loves us. He wants us to move up. What did Paul say? It's time for meat, but I have to keep giving you milk because you're not ready for the meat. That's in your Bible. I'm ready for more, God. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. Our lack of faith is revealed when we're required to do more than we feel like we're able to do. Think about sometimes when we say, oh, I can't do that. Ever been around somebody who's like, can't, we can't do that. We can't make it. That's not going to happen. We and you feel like, come on, man, have a little bit of faith. And you want to encourage them, come on. Idolatry is revealed when God's asking us to sacrifice some things that we want to. You can preach about anything you want, preacher, but just don't touch my fill in the blank. Immaturity is revealed when we can't have our way. That's immature. And self-will is revealed when we're required something that goes against our personal ambitions. But you know, it's not our will. What did Jesus say? Nevertheless, thy will be done. Are you ready to say that this morning? Nevertheless, thy will. Even though it's humble, Lord, help my will to crumble. What could be more important than God's will? In fact, Jesus said when you pray, what should you pray? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Is that how you pray? Thy will be done as long as it doesn't get in the way of what I'm wanting to do. Oh no. Thy will be done. It doesn't have any conditions except in the case of <laughs> parentheses. If you could show me there where it says except in the case of, it has a set of parentheses. It doesn't. Thy will be done. That's how we should pray, Lord. Thy will, Lord. I want your will for my life. I want your will in this situation. I'm ready to lay my, my will on the altar and give it to you, God. Whatever you would have me to do, you have to be first. First. And then everything else will just fall into place and be so much better than I could have ever done it. I look back at my life and I say, God, I was messing it up. I remember years ago, years ago, this is when I learned about me. I'm going to share a story with you. This is how I learned about me. I was in eighth grade football. I want to say it was eighth grade. Seventh or eighth grade football, right about that time frame. And I clearly remember a coach grabbing me by the face. But I don't think you'd be allowed to do that today. I would complain. <laughs> but he was grabbing my face mask. You could do that back then. And he looked directly at me. And he said these words to me. I'm responsible for 47 guys. You're only responsible for one. And you're messing it up. <laughs> and he was right. I 
wonder sometimes if the Lord looks at us and He says, Come on. My will. My will. Just line up with my will. That's what God wants us to do. We're all on the Lord's side here. Who's on the Lord's side? When Moses came down off of the mountain, he looked around and he said, Who is on the Lord's side? That's what we have to do. It's all about Him. We have to take our plans, our goals, our ambitions, and we just lay them on the altar and give them to God. Tests and trials. These things do happen in our lives. There's no denying it. I'm not going to stand up here and sugarcoat it and tell you every day is going to be the best day of your life. Not going to do it. This is from Rick Warren. He's written a lot of positive, purpose-driven type books. And I am not going to stand up here and tell you I agree with all of his philosophies. He's way off base with many of his things. But I will say this. There is one thing that he has latched on to that he has, he has nailed it 100%. You had better have a purpose for your life. There's a lot of people who wander around and they have no sense of purpose. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not eat the king's meat, and he did not. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I believe they had a purpose. And they said, I will not bow to that image. Throw me in that fiery furnace if you must. But I'm telling you right now, I will not bow to your image, king. They had a purpose. And if you do not have a purpose, guess what you're going to do? You're going to flounder. You're not going to have any direction, and you're going to be easy prey for the devil. There are so many people who fill churches across this country, and they have no purpose. Well, I don't know. Um. Anyways, this is what he writes, and... He, he has the Phillips translation here, but he says, You are temporarily harassed by all kinds of trials and temptations, which is what we're talking about this morning. This is no accident. It happens to prove your faith. And I actually totally liked this story when I saw it. That's why I want to share it with you. I believe you can... You can look at other writers and you can pull things out that you... I don't like everything Max Lucado says. I'm going to tell you right now. I would not go to him to learn about the Holy Ghost in Acts 2.38. But there are a lot of things in his stories where he talks about human nature and he pulls out things in the Bible where, where he sees things that I look at and I go, wow, I've never seen that before. He just has a gift we're looking into Bible characters and bringing things out and making it alive to me. And it helps me. But you have to sift through it. I'm just giving you a word of warning there. Okay? So you're temporarily harassed by all kinds of trials and temptations. Do you ever have days when nothing seems to go right? I once heard about a guy whose apartment was flooded from a broken pipe in the upstairs apartment. His manager said... Go rent a water vacuum. But he couldn't because his car had a flat tire. He changed it and went inside again to phone a friend, but he got an electric shock from the phone. That startled him, and he unintentionally ripped the phone from the wall. During that time, the water damage had jammed the door to his apartment. So a neighbor had to kick his apartment door down so he could get out. While all this was going on, somebody stole his car. But the car was almost out of gas, so he found the car a few blocks away and had someone push it to a gas station so he could fill up the tank. When he got back home, he discovered that four of his canaries had been crushed by falling plaster from the roof and the water leak. 
after slipping on the wet carpet <laughs> and badly injuring his tailbone, the guy began to wonder if God wanted me dead but kept missing. <laughs> Even if you've never had a day quite that bad, you've likely discovered that life is full of problems, pressures, and stresses. Did you know that the Bible says we shouldn't be surprised by life's problems? It says, you are temporarily harassed by all kinds of trials and temptations. This is no accident. It happens to prove your faith. 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. If you are a believer, nothing comes into your life by accident. Everything is father-filtered. I like that, father-filtered. It comes through God first, right? The Bible doesn't say everything's good, but as Romans 8 and 28 says, God causes everything to work together for good to those who love God and are the called according to His purpose. Even the difficulties, the irritations, and the interruptions, they all have a purpose. We don't usually realize it when we're in the situation and may not want to admit it afterward, but every problem has a greater purpose. God does it to prove our faith. So how do you want to respond to the difficulties? James 1 and 2 says, Consider yourselves fortunate when all kinds of trials come your way. For you know that when your faith succeeds in facing such trials, the result is the ability to endure. God uses difficulties to test your faith, and you increase in faith when you rejoice continually and keep a positive attitude in spite of things not going right. When you remain grateful and positive and continue trusting, God, even in the middle of difficulties, trusting God, even in the middle of difficulties, your faith is stretched. So, considering what we just read there, we know that all things work together for good, according to Romans 8 and 28. They work together for good. However, some people allow the times of trust testing to disillusion them. Have you ever seen somebody who goes through things and they go, that is just so discouraging, it makes me want to just look away from God instead of to God. And I'm going to tell you, when I face difficulties in life, it drives me to God. Where could I go? Right? Where could I go but to the Lord? You know, when these things come in my life, it makes me want to go to God even more. It makes me realize I need a higher power. I need help. I can't face it alone. I don't want to face it alone ever. Right? I do not allow these situations to caused me to become distraught, distracted, angry, bitter, hardened. It has just the opposite effect on me. The one thing that you are able to control, we can't control everything that comes in our lives, agreed? Things that come at you, you can't always control that. But there is one thing you can control, your response. How will you respond to it? Will you respond like Job? He did not charge God foolishly. And he said, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He continued to live for God and praise God anyway. And he knew that God was going to bless him in the end. We can have the response in our lives that no matter what happens, we will trust God. I choose to trust I choose to trust God, whatever comes my way, whatever kind of a test that I'm going through, I want my faith to come through and to be like gold at the end, 
when the, when the trial of my faith. So what are the blessings of the wilderness test? You will see the supernatural work of God. In the end, you will be blessed. You're going to look at, back at it and you're going to say, how did that happen? You know, those, the people, the children of Israel, at the end of their journey, the people looked and they noticed, our shoes didn't wear out. We still have shoes on our feet. We still got to eat every day. And the pillar of the cloud was with us the whole time until they got to the promised land. God was with them the whole way. It was a supernatural work of God. The rock followed them, and the water was flowing the whole time they were in the wilderness. God was taking care of them. They had the assurance that God was there to care for them and to provide for their needs. There is just an assurance knowing that you are not alone. I tell you, I would not want to face one day alone. If I had to go back and live my life over again, what would I do different? Every day with Jesus. Better is one day. One day in His courts. One day with Jesus. I would not want to, to be without Jesus for one day. You have the assurance of the power of God in your life. You have the assurance that he is faithful. And how does this happen? When you allow him to renew your mind. You know, it doesn't make any sense. People in the world would look at all the things that you're going through, and they would be like Job's wife. Why don't you just curse God and die? <laughs> all the things that you're going through, and you're still being faithful to God? What do you say? You talk like a foolish woman. Where else can I go but to God? God has a plan. And I trust Him. Whatever comes my way, I know I am better off with God on my side. I cannot turn away from God. All right. The second test I'm going to talk about is patience. This is a very difficult test. Notice what it says in Hebrews 10 and 36. For you have need of patience. Does anybody feel like you need patience? Oh, I tell you, I need more patience. My patience sometimes wears so thin. I'm like, come on. You're, you're kidding me, right? <laughs> Come on now. For you have need of patience. After that you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. God is going to pay, but he doesn't pay every Friday. But he does pay. Sometimes it takes many years. It takes a long time sometimes, and you have to patiently endure and hang on to receive the promise. Patience is hard to come by in today's fast-paced world. And I tell you, uh, if you don't believe that, just drive around. You ever heard of road rage? Have you ever experienced road rage? And it is a very real, it is, it is, a, what, it is getting to be one of the more common calls for service to the uh, 911. They try to sneak it in as a reckless driver, but it's actually road rage. He caught me off. There's a car aggressively changing lanes. And what were you doing right before he cut in front of you? They always leave that part out, right? So. But there's, there's a, just an aggressiveness going on right now. It's like a hostility. You know, fierce. There's a, uh, just a fierceness. And you're just seeing it in the world right now. And I believe that it's like the days of Noah. Anybody feel like we're living in the days of Noah? 
just a lawlessness and a fierceness, violence, and uh, patience is the exact opposite of that. You know, people just don't have any patience for each other. And over the simplest little things, you know, it's, you look at the, uh, the news and, oh, it's, they messed up on my French fry. <laughs> a French fry order. And there was a shooting at the McDonald's over, over a French fry order. And I'm thinking, maybe they just needed a little more patience. You know, they're, they're convinced that this person purposely messed up on their, their French fry order or something silly like that. And so they actually did some kind of physical harm to them over something silly like that. And it just... It, it escalates. But I believe that Christians, we cannot allow that, that spirit, even though we're in the world and we're affected by that, that, I just call it just plain old meanness. It's just a meanness, you know. You get this mean spirit, and if you're not careful, when you're driving around, you get behind that wheel. <laughs> You could, you could become a little bit aggressive, you know. You got to catch yourself and just draw back a little bit. You don't want to fall into that trap. And so, but we have to be uh, patient. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit. Goodness, meekness, temperance, faith. You know, God wants us to have patience in our life. So, how are we patient with God? I think when we look at the life of Abraham, we can really see that Abraham teaches us that if we will be patient and trust in God, and he also teaches us, you know, everybody's life can be an example, right? And it can be a bad example. You want to be a good example with your life, but you can be a bad example too. There's some things in Abraham's life that, that he did that not everything was perfect. You know, when you see his life, he got ahead of the plan of God. He stepped out of the will of God a couple of times. But for the most part, he held on to the promise of God and he was faithful and he believed God and he did everything that God wanted him to do. But when you look at the promises that God made to him, he said, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those that bless you. I will all curse those that curse you. And all of the people of the earth will be blessed through you. And, of course, that's in uh, Genesis 12, where he called Abraham out from the, the Ur of the Chaldees. And he promised him that through his seed, the entire world would be blessed. And it's sad, folks, but if you haven't been paying attention to the news, the schools are starting back up, and they are right back to it. And they are absolutely silent. Our government is absolutely silent. And they're already attacking these Jewish students. And uh, it's, it's horrible to watch. I can't hardly stand to watch it. It just infuriates me. The old man chases me every time I see it. I just get so angry. And, uh, and it's just, there's no, absolutely zero leadership. Zero leadership from the top telling them to stop it. Knock it off. But no, they won't say a word about it. And uh, because they desperately want their votes. That, let's just be honest. They desperately want their votes. And so they're not going to say a thing about it. And so they're just, uh, these people, they're just going to let them get away with it. They're going to continue to tolerate it. And so they're, uh, they're basically, uh, they, actually though, uh, I saw one silver lining, not to digress too far, but uh, in, uh, I believe it was UCLA, it was one of the California schools, uh, some of the Jewish students got together and filed a lawsuit and said that we were being denied access because they were standing in front of doorways and buildings and they were denying the, the Jewish students uh, access into the building. I showed you all the video where they were standing in front of them and wouldn't let them come into the buildings even though they paid. And uh, they filed a lawsuit through the federal government because the state wasn't going to do anything. That's Gavin Newsom. He don't care but the, the federal, to the federal government, and the federal government ordered UCLA, said, you're violating their civil rights. 
and you cannot deny them access to buildings if they're, isn't that sad? And UCLA was actually fighting it. They were fighting it, saying, no, you can't make us go over there and order those other people to let them into the building. <laughs> How could you even fight that? But they were, they were actually fighting for the right to look the other way so that these Jewish students could be denied access to the buildings. And, uh, but they, the, the federal judge came in and said, no, you will guarantee these Jewish students, based on their religion, cannot be denied access into those. So I'm, I'm hoping maybe we're going to turn the corner and the federal, at least the judiciary, the judiciary will, I mean, we're not going to get anything from the president, but the judiciary at least will take a stand and try to uh, stop some of this. It's just blatant discrimination is what it is, folks. It's hate and it's discrimination. And we're supposed to take a stand against discrimination, period. Right? Agreed? God made all the people of one blood. I believe that. God loves everybody. I believe that. God loves all people. Amen. All the people of the earth will be blessed through Abraham. And so the promises that God gave to Abraham, these uh, personal blessings, personal protection from his enemies, and he gave him uh, a purpose. What did Abraham do? I believe that what Abraham had to do was he had to make up his mind that he was going to grab onto these promises. Sometimes you have to hold on. You just have to hold on because it's not going to be overnight. It's not going to be one day. Sometimes it's not one week. You know, if God has promised you that your family is going to be saved, guess what you do? You hold on to that promise. And you say, Lord, I'm holding on to that promise. I'm believing your word. Because I, I noticed when I was, uh, let me see here. Look at this. Abraham was 75 years old. Now, that seems pretty old. However, <laughs> however, relatively speaking, 75 is not that old. Abraham was 86 when Ishmael was born. And Abraham was 100 when Isaac was born. So when you think about that, he waited 11 years to see. To, after 11 years, he kind of got ahead of the game and tried to do something himself. But he had to wait 25 years to see the promise of his son. Through, through your son, you are going to have a son. Your, your seed will be like the stars of heaven, of the heavens. So he had to wait 25 years. How long have you had to wait in your life to see some of your promises that God has given you? Would you still be faithful to God after all of those years? And he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And we know that Abraham still lived in tents. He was a pilgrim, and he was still living in tents. He was still looking for a city his whole life. Now, we know that there's a place called Abraham's bosom. Because Jesus, remember, when he said... I look across there and I see Abraham's bosom and uh, send a, a drop of water to put on my tongue. But there's a big gulf, but I see Abraham's bosom over there. That scripture's in the New Testament, talking about Abraham's bosom. So Abraham, I believe he received promises, but he had to wait. He had to hold on for those promises. And I see the, the seed of Abraham. They inherited the land of promise. Joseph, he said, don't leave my bones in Egypt. 
because one day you're getting out of here because God promised Abraham that you would be going to the promised land. And when they went to the promised land, they took the bones of Joseph with them into the promised land. And so you can hang on to the promise. Now, what test is it that from the time you receive the promise until the time the promise is fulfilled, I believe it's the, the test of patience or the test of time. You can call it what you will, but it's a, a test of your holding on and saying, I'm not going to let go of that promise. Whatever comes my way, God, I believe that you are going to honor your word and I'm going to continue to be faithful and live for you because I know that your promises are yea and amen. And you are not going back on your promises. And even if it takes 25 years, 50 years, I know that your promises are not going to change. God cannot lie. The gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. God cannot change. His word cannot change. It's settled forever in heaven. If he's told you a promise, you just hang on to it and believe that it will come to pass. Lord, increase my patience. But hurry. <laughs> <laughs> hurry and increase my patience I feel like that sometimes I'm like Lord I mean this is an easy one to teach about but it is a hard one to, to live because you know that sometimes it takes a long time to, to hold on but I do believe that God is faithful God is faithful and he is not going to to let you down wait for the Lord be strong and let your heart take courage in Psalms 27 and 14 I waited patiently for the Lord he inclined to me and heard my cry Psalms 40 and 1 I waited patiently for the Lord that's what the psalmist said can you say that today I waited patiently I waited patiently for the Lord Psalms 37 and 7 says, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Fret not yourself. Don't worry about it. Don't fret. Just wait patiently for the Lord. Psalms 4, Isaiah 40 and 31 says, They that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. Romans 8 and 25 says, But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. That's exactly what we're doing. With many times, we don't see it right in front of us. We're just patiently waiting for it and believing God. Here's some good ones with controlling our, uh, our spirits. Whosoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. That's in Proverbs 14 and 29. And so what's the opposite of that? Patience. You know, sometimes things happen and an offense happens in our life. And guess what we do? Let's turn it over to the Lord. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. I love this one. Whosoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit is better than he who takes a city. If you can control your spirit, you're better than a person who can take a city. Better is the end of a thing than its beginning, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not quick in your spirit to become anger, for anger lodges in the bosom of fools. Woo! That's in Ecclesiastes 7. And Romans 12 and 12 says, Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Beautiful. Rejoice in hope, patient in tribulation, constant in prayer. Some beautiful scriptures. Here's the scripture I was referring to in Genesis 12, where he's making the promises to Abraham, where he's telling him to 
uh, get out of his uh, country, away from his kindred, from his father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Genesis 12 is a beautiful chapter. And I am going to pause right there. Let me get up to my song. Let's stand. Think about some of the promises that God has given you and say, Lord, help me to patiently receive what you have for me. Let's take a few moments and talk to the Lord this morning. Talk to the Lord about the promises that he has made to you today. Thank you, Jesus. Every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Woo! To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There is power. Come on. In the name of Jesus. Come on, you declare it. There is power. There is power, there is power in the name, in the name of Jesus. We know where it is to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Come on, say to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There's an all. There's an army rising up. There's an army. 